everybody, and welcome to this video lecture where we're going to get started learning some foundational information about the structure of the raster data model and how it contrasts with the vector data model. So if you remember, uh, a while back ago, we said there are two major ways that we can store information or data about geographic features on the planet. We have two major data models for this. And the first one was the vector data model. We've looked at that extensively at this point, worked with it a lot, and I hope that if somebody uh, says vector data model, vector GIS data, you should immediately think about points, lines, polygons, or points, lines, and areas, thinking about that geometry, and then thinking about an attribute table, and then thinking about that connection between an attribute table and some geometric representation. And that's really what made the vector data model work that's a simple idea that uh, at its core, but there is a whole lot of things that you can do with that and it gives you a tremendous amount of power. That's the core of the vector data model and we're going to contrast that now with the raster data model. The raster data model uh, is about maps as numbers. You frequently have this phrase that you hear when people are talking about rasters, which is maps as numbers. And so basically what rasters allow us to do is to be able to take a map and then convert it into numbers rather directly. And then we can do all kinds of mathematical manipulation on those numbers in order to solve problems, answer questions, and conduct whatever analysis that we want to do. If you are mathematically inclined, if you like math, you're probably really going to like working with rasters because if you can think about how you're going to conduct your analysis, if you can think about what you want to do in uh, whatever it is that you're analyzing, whatever analytical process that you want to accomplish, if you can think about how to do it mathematically, then you're going to be very, uh, you're going to be able to very easily and directly apply that mathematics uh, to the rasters in order to compute what you want to compute. So in some ways the raster data model is easier for computation than the vector data model. We have all those specialized tools in the core GIS toolkit that we were talking about which are sort of our foundational tools. We have less foundational tools actually in the raster data model because the tools that we have are much more encompassing uh, because they are just about mainly doing raw mathematics on these rasters and then producing some output that has meaning. So we'll look at uh, what's kind of the equivalent of our raster uh, tool set uh, in future videos. But also rasters are at their core a grid of cells. Okay, so when you think vector, points, lines, polygons, raster data model, grids of cells, maps as numbers. So what we're going to do, what do we do with all those numbers? How do we generate those numbers or what do we do with them? Well, we're going to have this grid of cells that we're going to overlay uh, on the area that we are interested in studying and that we are interested in representing some geographic feature or phenomenon inside. And then we're going to put numbers inside each one of those cells in order to represent uh, the feature the way that we would like to have it represented. So grids of cells with numbers in them are the very core of what it means to represent something in the raster data model. So in the raster data model you do not have geometry and you do not have an attribute table. We're not talking about geometry and links to attribute tables here. We're just talking about grids of cells with numbers in them. Okay, let me give you two foundational rules for rasters. And these are pretty simple rules. Rasters are conceptually simple. The vector data model was conceptually simple as well. But the raster data model is, is very conceptually simple. And we have these grids of cells, and then we're going to follow these two very simple rules. The first is that every cell can contain one and only one value. Okay, we're going to be able to put our number inside each one of these cells, but it's critically important that every cell only gets one. You can't put more than one value per cell. So every cell can contain one and only one value or number. That means we're going to have to be very deliberate about what number we put into each cell. We want to make sure it's a good one, so to speak, because we only get one per cell, and we'll look at different techniques for putting numbers into these cells later. 
but every cell can get one and only one value or number. And also, each cell in a raster has to be exactly the same size. So rasters do not look like what I have over here on the right. Every cell in a raster must be the exact same size. So let me X that out. Now, of course, you can have different rasters with different size cells, uh, different size cells across different rasters. But every time you have one single raster, they are all going to be the same size cells. So we take this grid, we make them all, uh, every cell the exact same size, and we put uh, only one number in it. Well, basically, we are off uh, to the races as far as the uh, raster data model goes because we have our sort of core foundation then. Let me also introduce to you this idea of spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is another very core component of the raster data model and something we need to understand because it's always with us. So basically what spatial resolution does is communicate to us the amount of area that each one of those cells on the planet represents. So each cell in each particular raster represents some area on the planet, right? We're going to geoposition this grid of cells over uh, a planet, so it's got a look over the planet, so we've got a location, uh, the location for it, and then we're going to look at every one of those cells and we're going to say, okay, this cell represents this certain area. So it's very important when you're working with rasters to communicate what the spatial resolution of the raster is. Are you talking about each cell representing some giant amount of uh, land area or a much smaller area? It doesn't have to be land, could be ocean. Uh, but what is that? In this case, for instance, we're looking at, let's say, a 30 meter raster. So this is what you would call a 30 meter raster, spatial resolution of 30 meters. What does that mean? That means that every single one of those cells, remember they're all the same size, is representing an area that is 30 meters by 30 meters on each side. So in this case, that means that every single one of the cells in this raster would represent a location with uh, an area of 900 meters square. So I would have to represent everything that has to do with the feature or phenomenon that I'm representing in this particular raster with one value over a 30 by 30 meter area if I have a 30 meter raster. And rasters do come in varying spatial resolutions, and that's why you have to be able to look that up or know where to find that information when you download a raster or otherwise acquire one. Or when you make one, it's important to include that information in the metadata when you exchange it with somebody else. I do want to note that all of the rasters that I'm showing you here in this video lecture have been simplified. I'm just going to be showing you a relatively small number of cells larger so that we can see them and we can understand what's going on as far as uh, their manipulation goes. But rasters often contain thousands of cells, tens of thousands of cells, or more. And that's typically the way that we work with rasters when you're in software and you're downloading them. But for our purpose of understanding the theory behind them, I'm simplifying to much simpler rasters so that we can, we can visually see them. Think about when we were looking at the weather map that had uh, all of the temperature across the United States. We just saw a gradation of colors over there. We weren't looking at individual cells across that map, and that's because there were so many cells and they are so small. So we don't typically, when you're working in the software, work with rasters with just, uh, what is this, nine different cells here. We're, we're working with rasters with thousands and thousands of cells, and that's why using computer systems to manipulate them. Computers are very good at math, of course. That's how they help us with projections, for one thing. Or well, they also help us manipulate our rasters because we'll need to do mathematical operations across thousands and thousands of cells, potentially, or more. And uh, a computer will help us out with that and is very happy to take care of that for us. And we don't have to go in and, and look at the rasters cell by cell like this. So anyway, just keep that in mind. So if we have this uh, simplified raster right here, one value per cell, then what kind of information would you like to store in that raster? Well, we can use it to store all kinds of information. Do you want to store information about land cover or elevation or rainfall or the depths of the sea or ozone concentrations or population density or whatever? We can represent uh, all kinds of geographic 
uh, phenomena using the raster data model. So you uh, choose what you're interested in representing, and then what value you assign to each cell is sort of up to you. Now you're probably going to determine uh, some methodology you want the computer to execute in order to assign values to all of these thousands and thousands of cells. But the value you assign and how you do that is up to you. And I will also point out that the meaning of the values cannot be determined simply by examining the raster. You know, I can fill up this raster that I see right up here with all kinds of numbers, but what do those numbers represent? Are the numbers supposed to represent rainfall total or total elevation, or does it represent the bathymetry of a lake, or is it population density? There's no way that you can just determine what it is that is being represented or by these values just by studying the raster itself. And that's why it's also important to make sure that you have metadata for this reason, because uh, the metadata has to accompany the raster in order to let somebody else know what it is that that is supposed to be representing, and also how the raster was created, because that's important as well. We'll talk about that later. Let's just take a look for the purposes of our examples right now at uh, land cover. Let's do, let's look at a uh, land cover. Say we want to store a land cover in a raster for our examples. Let's look at that uh, in, by also introducing this term here, binary raster. Binary rasters are going to be very helpful to you in a lot of different circumstances. They're very useful. A binary raster here, like the one we have here, uh, is one in which every cell is only allowed to be coded 0 or 1. Well, now I guess that technically binary in a broad sense, any one of two values, but you know, traditionally we use zeros and ones, and then also from a mathematical standpoint, there are reasons why we would want to have 0 and 1 here that we'll talk about as we go into how to do raster processing and solving problems and answering questions with rasters. 0 becomes uh, very helpful in that. So here we're looking at a raster that is storing land cover information, and we have 1 where water is, and we have 0 where water is not. So rasters, uh, binary rasters of this sort, are often used to record the presence or absence of some phenomenon. So in here we're talking about water. We're just saying 1, okay, that means there is water there, and then 0, no water. And this gives us an idea about the uh, distribution of water in the area of interest. And of course, again, if I had a, a much larger raster here and had 10,000 cells or 100,000 cells and was covering a, a large chunk of the Earth, maybe at a spatial resolution of 30 meters, think about the spatial resolution of this. Uh, if I had a spatial resolution of 30 meters, then every 30 meters I would go by and assign a value. Is there water or is there no water? That's a binary raster. Let's look at a series of these. So here is a series of binary rasters for land cover information. Maybe these rasters represent are, are located in the same area. They're representing the same thing. But here I'm interested in more land cover information than just where's the water. I've got water in this area. I've got forest in this area. And I've got grassland in this area. And so I have three different binary rasters one that's showing water, one that's showing forest, and one that's showing grassland. And then I can use these in my analysis and do whatever kind of ma mathematical manipulation I'm going to want to do with them. I don't have to represent the data in this way though. What if I wanted to move to a non-binary way of representing it? So here is a single combined land cover raster. This is no problem. Uh, I can, I can uh, rasters in general can store more values than just zero or one uh, if I want to move away from a binary format. So this is not a binary raster. And in this case, I'm saying one means water, two means grassland, and three means forest. So here I just have a qualitative kind of data scheme. You know, one, that's just a label. Right, I'm using that value 1 to represent water. Of course, 2 doesn't mean it's twice as much as 1 in this particular raster because 2 is just a label for grassland. 3 is just a label for forest. 
you can assign whatever colors you would like to your raster. So we were looking at a color stretch earlier with temperature across the United States. But I can go in and I can assign, hey, I'd like all of the uh, cells with one to be represented or to be shown in blue. And then I've got these two different color greens for grassland and forest. And the computer will symbolize a raster. This is the way that you symbolize rasters. We've already talked about how do you symbolize vector data sets. Well, this is the symbology that we can do with a raster data set. So as you might expect, just as the symbolization of vector data sets do not matter for analytical purposes, likewise color of raster data sets, the symbology of your raster data sets, does not matter for any analytical purpose. The analysis is done on the numbers, on the values that are stored in each cell. We don't often look at the numbers in each cell because like I said, these rasters that I'm showing you up here are much simplified and enlarged so that we can see what's going on. But we often don't just look, you zoom into a raster and you don't see a value there. You just see whatever color, whatever symbology has been assigned. And really you don't often see the, the cells themselves either. So if I were to symbolize this and this blue and green color scheme, I might just look at this. And this looks like what you would see if you zoomed into a much larger raster on your computer and we're taking a look at the, uh, the individual cells here. But for our purposes right here, I'll probably look at them a lot like this with the numbers up so you can see exactly what's going on in them. Okay, well I guess I will leave that uh, right here for this video and uh, I will see you again in the next lesson.